Today we are going to be building this. This is a $1,400 relatively compact ITX gaming PC that is really solid for 1080p and 1440p gaming. Now this is going to be pretty different from my usual build videos. This is not going to be cinematic or anything like that. This is going to be more focused for those beginners who don't know much about PC building. Basically, if you've never built a PC before, this would be a really great place to start. The great thing is that we're going with the NZXT A H1, which despite being fairly compact at just 13 and a half liters in volume, it's one of the easiest PC builds that you could probably do today. So let's take a look at all of the parts, we'll go over the build process, and we'll finally see how this thing performs in games. So at $1,400, you're getting a pretty compact gaming rig that takes up barely any room on your desk and also stays relatively quiet under full load. Let's jump in and take a look at the parts, starting with the CPU. So here we're going with AMD's Ryzen 5 3600, which I'd definitely consider the sweet spot as a gaming CPU option at the moment. You're getting six cores and 12 threads on AMD's current generation architecture, and that's going to give us a nice stable frame rate performance in games with no stuttering. That's something that you might experience if you opt for a similarly priced Intel CPU instead, such as the i5-9400, which only has six total threads. We're going to be slotting that Ryzen 5 CPU into the Asus Strix B450i motherboard, and the great thing here is that this board supports third gen Ryzen CPUs out of the box. That means no messing around with BIOS updates and having to borrow a previous gen chip. I've also done an in-depth video on this motherboard comparing it to the much more expensive X570i version, and in short, I can only recommend opting for that more expensive X570 variant if you're using a 16-core 3950X or maybe the 12-core 3900X. For our 6-core processor though, this B450i version is ideal. For storage, we're going with a single 1TB M.2 NVMe drive. The one that I'm using here is a fairly expensive Gen 4 drive, but I'll link a much more suitable and affordable model down below. Installation is identical and performance for gaming for most real world tasks will be virtually the same. For memory, we're going with 16 gigabytes total rated for 3200 megahertz, and this is a Corsair Vengeance LPX kit. Fairly straightforward, 16 gigabytes is the sweet spot currently for gaming, and thankfully memory prices have come down significantly over the past few months. Probably the most flexible part of this build though is the GPU, and here I'm going with Nvidia's RTX 2070 Super. Now if you want to save around $100 US on this build, you could go for AMD's RX 5700 XT instead, which honestly performs within 5-7% to on average of the RTX 2070 Super that we're going with here. If you're more confident with performance tuning and troubleshooting, you might want to go for that 5700 XT. The GPU drivers there are less stable based on community feedback, and the thermals could be worse depending on which specific card you buy. But if you want the safer option in terms of drivers and overall performance, go for the 2070 Super like I have here. This would also be the better choice if you maybe could see yourself streaming or doing some H.265 video encoding on the side. In that case, you can benefit from the power powerful onboard encoder on the NVIDIA card. And lastly, we have the NZXT H1, one of the best cases that I've had the pleasure to review in terms of building and user experience. And the great thing here is that the power supply and liquid cooler for the CPU are already pre-installed. That means that you won't have to worry about having to source and buy these two parts or even taking the extra steps to install them. So let's get started. And the first step is to install our CPU into our motherboard. The CPU socket is in the center of the board and can be opened by lifting and pulling back that small latch that's attached next to it. The latch should sit at 90 degrees to completely unlock the CPU socket. You want to be a little bit careful when handling that CPU and only hold it on the sides. Don't touch the bottom where the pins are. Installation here is fairly simple. You want to line up the small gold triangle on the CPU with the triangle on the CPU socket. Slowly place it in and don't drop it and you shouldn't need to use any force. In the end, you should have the Ryzen text facing the IO side of the board. Once the processor is seated, you can close the latch and the CPU is now installed. Now we'll install our RAM. This build and motherboard uses two 8GB sticks. 
To install these, we want to unlock the two slots to the right of the board by releasing the two latches at the top. Next, you'll want to line up the small notch on the memory sticks with the notch in the slots and carefully insert them with an even amount of pressure. You should hear a small click when they're installed and seated correctly with the latch now fully closed. Next up is our storage. So grab that M.2 NVMe drive and we're going to install this in the primary slot on the front of the board. This is accessed by removing the two screws shown here. You've also got a thermal pad underneath here that you'll need to remove the protective film from. I've already done that. Finally, there's just another screw that secures the M.2 storage drive in place. So you wanna remove that, carefully install the drive into the slot and then secure it with that small screw. Reinstall the heatsink cover with those two screws that we removed earlier, and believe it or not, we've actually completed a good portion of this build. The motherboard is now ready to be installed into the NZXT H1 case. So unbox the H1, remove the front and rear panel, and then you'll be able to slide the main part of the enclosure vertically off the frame. The first thing that we need to do here is remove these two screws here, which secure the liquid cooler's 140 mm radiator to the frame. This will release the radiator and allow it to hinge back and out of the way. This now gives us access to the motherboard tray, but before you install the motherboard, you want to install the motherboard's IO shield. You'll find this in your motherboard's box. Fairly straightforward installation here next to where the motherboard will sit. You might have to fiddle with it and apply a bit of force. But now we can finally install the motherboard. I find that sliding it in through one of the sides is the easiest way here. The board should line up nicely with that IO shield. You'll find the motherboard screws in the accessory box for the H1. These will be labeled six to 32 by five millimeters and there's four screws in total at each corner of the board. Now that the board is in place, we can start plugging everything in. And let's start with the PCIe riser cable that connects our motherboard to our GPU. This is already bent and in place, ready to be installed thanks to NZXT. This slots directly into the motherboard's PCIe slot at the bottom, and you wanna double check just to make sure that it's fully seated. Next up, we'll install the front panel connector, the front USB connector, and also the HD audio cable. You'll likely find these hanging somewhere within the interior of the case, not jammed up behind the power supply cover like I had here. I recommend starting with that front panel connector, seeing as that's the most finicky, and this will plug in towards the right side of the board directly underneath the plug for the 24 pin motherboard cable. Next is the HD audio cable and for our board this plug is hiding between the Wi-Fi module and the M.2 slot. Then we have the bulky front USB cable. This plugs in towards the lower right side of the board. The 24 pin motherboard cable is next and thankfully that's right in place where it should be. It just needs to be lowered and then seated into the connector. Again, specifically for this plug, you wanna double check that this one is seated properly. It's a common error among beginner PC builders that this one isn't fully connected. The eight pin CPU power cable is also in place, just hovering above that connector pretty easy to install there. And then the last two cables that we'll need to plug in, the four pin CPU fan cable and the three pin DC cable for the pump on our liquid cooler. The CPU cable plugs into the leftmost fan header and the pump cable plugs into the middle. All right, I'd say we're about 85% finished at this point. Next, we need to install some mounting hardware onto our CPU cooler so that we can actually mount it to the CPU and motherboard. Firstly, you want to clip on that AM4 mounting bracket like shown. This will be in the NZXT H1 accessory box and just double check that that bracket is facing the correct way and rotated this way as well. Now out of the box, this liquid cooler will have thermal paste pre-applied on the bottom of the cold plate. And honestly, you're fine to just leave that on and use that. Of course, seeing as I've used this case before in builds previously, that thermal paste has been cleaned off. So I'll be applying my own for this build, just something worth mentioning. But Next, you'll need the retention screw and right angle clip installed like shown. Again, these will be in the accessory box. They'll screw together as one piece right through the bracket and it's important to keep it nice and loose. These two brackets on either side will hook onto the little latches that are pre-installed onto our motherboard and then it's just a matter of tightening them up. This will increase the mounting pressure of the liquid cooler onto the CPU. Once it gets fairly difficult to tighten and the block isn't going anywhere, then it's tight enough. Lastly, 
close that radiator hinge back to where it was initially, make sure that there aren't any cables or tubing that's getting caught in the way, and reinstall it with those two screws that we removed earlier. Now this side of the build is completely done, so let's flip it around and finally install our GPU. There's two screws towards the bottom of the case that line up the graphics card with the expansion slots. You'll need to remove those two screws so that we can properly install our 2070 Super. Installation here is fairly straightforward, just line up the PCIe slot with the graphics card, apply a bit of force, and it should seat nicely like shown. Then secure it with those two screws that we just removed, and then finally plug in those GPU power cables. For our RTX 2070 Super, we'll be needing an eight pin and a six pin PCIe power cable, which comes in the form of this cable. And this is a fairly straightforward installation as again, it's already so close to the connectors and in place. Just reinstall that power supply cable cover and you've just finished building a killer compact gaming rig. We're not going to go over the Windows 10 installation here. You can find plenty of generic and well-made videos that show how to do that online, but let's skip ahead to what you'll need to download and install once you've got Windows 10 running and updated. The first thing that you'll need to do is update your motherboard's BIOS. Although the CPU is compatible with this board and will function quite fine, it's likely that the board didn't ship with the most updated BIOS that usually optimizes the CPU's performance. This is pretty easy to do. Just head over to your manufacturer's website. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Download the most updated BIOS onto a USB drive, restart your computer and repeatedly hit the delete key, bringing you to the motherboard BIOS, and then head over to the easy flash section, selecting the updated file. After that's updated, you'll also wanna go ahead and enable XMP to achieve the full speeds from our memory kit. This is found in the AI tweaker section by by selecting the DOCP standard setting next to AI overclock tuner. If you want, you can also access the fan curve for the CPU cooler by pressing F6. You can make adjustments here later on once you've gotten to know your system a bit better. There are also a few more drivers that you'll need to install onto your system to get it running up to spec. These include the updated AMD chipset drivers, the audio, ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth drivers for your motherboard, and lastly, the drivers for your GPU. Again, all links to these can be found down below in the description. But now let's talk about gaming performance, which is really what this system has been specced for. So with an RTX 2070 Super, this build is very, very capable at 1080p resolution and is also very suitable for 1440p. More esports focused titles will have no problem at all hitting above 240 frames per second if you don't mind dropping a couple of quality settings. And the majority of titles at 1080p high settings will have you sitting at around 120 FPS or thereabouts. Again, though that's pretty close to max quality and detail, so it just depends on what your priorities are. There's definitely plenty of room in the tank there if you want to bump the resolution up to 1440p. In terms of thermal performance, the RTX 2070 Super was hovering at around the 80 degree C mark, with the Ryzen 5 3600 sitting at around 60 C. This was after 30 minutes into a gaming session with the room temperature sitting at 24 degrees C. Now, although those GPU temperatures are a bit on the warmer end, they're still well within spec and a safe operating temperature, with the 2070 Super still boosting to around 1860 megahertz. Also, the system was pretty quiet during full gaming load, so there's plenty of room in the GPU's fan curve if you want to reduce that temperature a little yourself. Here's an idea of what you can expect in terms of noise. So playing the new Modern Warfare Warzone, I had an absolute blast playing on this compact rig. At $1,400, this is by no means the best performing rig for the money. However, it really is a solid deal without any problems whatsoever. Following the instructions in this video, I'm confident that a true beginner with zero experience with computers could get this gaming rig up and running within a couple hours with everything fully installed. So if you are interested in building this one or perhaps using it as a template at least, we'll have all of the parts down below in the description, as well as all of the drivers and software that you'll need too. So as always guys, a huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.